Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it in all its fullness. Friends, we're glad to connect with you for this service of healing and wholeness. There are many reasons why, why we might come together, that you might be drawn to this service today. Sickness and sickness of heart and fatigue or tiredness, coming out of the pandemic and the months of disruption, or maybe you've been ill with the virus itself or know someone who has. But for whatever reason, we're glad that we can connect and call upon God together today for the purpose of this service, which is to find healing and wholeness in the grace and the mercy of God and the work of God's Spirit in our lives. And so welcome, welcome, we welcome you as, even as we welcome the Spirit among us today. We hope that you have some oil gathered at your place if you have prepared for this service so that you might uh, participate in the anointing when we come to that part of the service. Oil will work. If you don't have oil, maybe you just uh, use some water or something else. But we are glad uh, to connect with you and do this together. So whatever you have will be fine. And we will instruct you when we come to that point of the service. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you have blessed us with the gift of life and placed us in a world of beauty and wonder. Your perfect will for us is wholeness in body, mind, and spirit. We bow in awe and wonder at your feet and freely acknowledge our dependence upon you for all that is good. In your presence, we remember our sin and failure, all that damages our lives, the lives of others, and the world which you have created. We humbly ask you to forgive us in the name of our Lord Jesus, who loves us and gave himself for us. Jesus said, come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And now let us pray together the prayer that Jesus gave us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our first scripture today comes from the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah, chapter 35. Hear these words. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. The majesty of Carmel and Sharon, they shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, be strong, do not fear. Here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. For water shall break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. The haunt of jackals shall become a swamp. The grass shall become reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there, and it shall be called the holy way. The unclean shall not travel on it, but it shall be for God's people. No traveler, not even fool, shall go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. And our second scripture comes from the Gospel of Matthew in the fifth chapter. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you please pray with me? Gracious God, in our fallibility and fragility, we come to you crying out from the ditches of life, hoping that you would be like the good Samaritan and bandage our wounds this day. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. My junior year of football started off with so much promise. As a junior, I was backing up two multi-year starting seniors at defensive end with the plan that I would uh, give them breathers throughout the season, gain a little experience, and then be the starter my senior year. I was quick. I was strong, had so much fun starting on our scout team defense and second string varsity, I couldn't wait to earn my letter that year. Then in our first inter-squad scrimmage on a Saturday morning in front of all our parents and friends, one of our running backs was tackled, helmet hitting the outside of my knee. I knew I was hurt right away, but I tried to pick myself up and get back to the line before crumpling to the ground. I remember my dad jogging across the field, helping me back to the locker room, then speeding to the McBride Sports Clinic where we were told that I had a broken femur 
and torn my MCL. As a high school kid who had all these dreams, who created himself on NCAA video games to play with, there was an emotional and identity spiral. I was scared that my football career was over, which honestly, it was over. I never was really able to recover that leg strength around uh, after the muscle atrophied. I was also on our high school tennis team, and after my injury ended that spring season, I found myself between the seven and eight spot, with only the top six qualifying for state, and wouldn't you know that would be the year we won it all. Even though I still got a ring and was part of the team and training to win it, I was still left with, what if? What if I hadn't lost six months to injury? What if instead of having to recover, I could have just built on top of What if I didn't have to work back? I think we've all found ourselves kept up at night wondering what if. Wondering what if, whether it's general pandemic or economic or racial or political anxiety or specific health or relational concerns, it's so natural to at night allow these what if questions to creep from our minds down into our bodies feeling the stress of pressures and uncertain futures to live deep in our very bones. Isaiah 35 talks about this. It's a powerful, poetic word of comfort for the Israelite exiles who are wondering, what if they've lost their temple, lost their land, lost their sovereignty? They've lost their freedom and identity, seemingly losing their promise and future. This suffering, this what if, is manifested in weak hands, feeble knees, a fearful heart, obscured vision, hindered hearing, broken bodies, and silent tongues. This scriptural body constructed in Isaiah 35 has been utterly overwhelmed by despair and weariness. Their capacities needed to move through this world diminished. Exiles feeling God's sorrow and their own grief deep in their bodies. Isaiah tells us that this is a message for those who have a fearful heart, and a more literal translation of this Hebrew says that Isaiah is speaking to those whose hearts are racing. It's to this real reality that we know to which Isaiah speaks here in 35. We read in verse 4 where Isaiah proclaims that God will come with vengeance and save us remembering that the Israelite people operated out of this religious cultural milieu that believed that God showed strength and military deliverance, which was their way of expressing God's faithfulness and blessing through presence, even in suffering. So even though a vengeful God may feel unfamiliar to us, we can believe Scripture when we read this phrase here as God's response or God's dealing. God is here. Restoration is on its way. Hope now, Isaiah says. Hope now in God's dealing. Expect God's response. This promise of God's response, the command to proclaim that God is here right now and is working to make things right, focuses our attention on our own needs, focuses on where we need God to respond, where we need God to show up in our lives, show up in our suffering in this place at this very moment, where in the now we need restoration, repair, healing, transformation. Now we know that healing doesn't always mean something's fixed. We've lived long enough and seen enough sickness and suffering that we know that prayer doesn't have a 100% fixed rate, but we know that God has a 100% presence rate, that God never gives up, and neither shall we. Some of you might find this hard to believe in the moment. I know I felt it after finding my leg immobilized for over a month. One of the biggest reminders was not being able to go to OU football games, missing out on using our season tickets and the rituals and habits around it. Each week, OU kicked off. It was another reminder of what I was missing out on. Some of you searching for healing today may know the feeling. 
And yet, looking back now with the gift of perspective, had I been able to go to OU games, had I never been injured, I would have never met my wife, Addison. It's a much longer story for another time, but I should have been at the OU homecoming game against TCU in 2008, but because of my injury and because OU was winning by so much, I felt like I could turn off the TV at halftime, go out with some friends to meet some girls from another school at a local park. Because of that, I met my future wife, the love of my life. When after my injury, when I would pray to God, when my heart would ache with what ifs, I never imagined that or what would be on the other side waiting for me. Now there were dreams cut short, paths diverted in my life. And we do not believe that faith in God guarantees us from any ailments or is an immunity to suffering, but we do believe that God uh, doesn't cause our suffering or sickness, but we profess that in these moments where our hearts ache and we are searching for deliverance, that God is deeply at work. The good news is that God does not abandon us in despair. Verse 10, Isaiah tells us that our sorrow will come to an end, that there will be a day when our sick body will find new life in God. The ransom, shall, uh, the ransom of the Lord shall return. They will come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Silent tongues will be loosed to sing songs of joy and freedom. Formerly feeble knees will walk themselves. Fearful hearts will look to the future with faith, hope, and courage, while sorrow and sighing will be on the run. In literature, underdog accounts such as these satisfy our thirst for happy endings. What would be the point of a folk tale in which conditions for the lowly went from bad to worse without dramatic happy ever afters? Why read detective or adventure novels in which chaos never clears, larger perspectives never appear, and the honorable are never vindicated? We read literature not so much for whether poetic justice will prevail, but how it will do so. Which twist or turn will arrive satisfying our souls how it should? We read scripture similarly. Read it searching and expecting hope. Stories beginning with barrenness end in fruitfulness. Heroes descend before they ascend, sold into Egypt, threatened with famine, subjected to evil edicts, surrounded by Assyrian forces. The saints of Scripture are pursued by rulers, abandoned by supporters, thrown into cisterns, shipwrecked, beaten, and even crucified dead. And yet, the Word of God rarely leaves us in such conditions. Scripture employs reversals to foster our hope. Now we know, we know painfully, that real life doesn't offer such tightly sewn plots. Happily ever after isn't inevitable. Reversals cannot necessarily be counted on. When we are the actors and not merely the audience, stories are more complex. Because life differs from literature in this way, we may be tempted to dismiss passages like Isaiah 35 as having little to do with reality. We may relegate miracles to a fantasy world in which we dare not seek to live. But, but if it's true, if it's true that hope that is seen is not really hope, it is also true that hope that is left unseen, that is not dared, is not hope either. It's true that presuming every blind eye will open, whether literally or metaphorically, is a presumptuous mistake, but so is a mistake to expect that blind eyes would never open. There's a middle way. In faith, we take a stance not of presumption, whether positive or negative, but a presumption of openness. A presumption of openness to the future, expectancy for the nearly unimaginable good that God can indeed be accomplished at any moment 
in any circumstance. As Christians, we are looking forward to something better, looking forward to something better than the suffering all around us. We are looking forward to the kindness and generosity and compassion of our God being fulfilled for everyone in our lives and in our world. This hope, this faith is what gives us encouragemental energy to sustain our love as we seek to transform our corner of the world and to shine in the dark nights of our souls, even our own. Our faith still rests in the good news that in Jesus the Christ, God has entered this world definitively to set everything right and to make all things new. That in Jesus the Christ, God has come into this world and become Emmanuel, God with us. And that in and through this marvelous event, light and life to all Christ brings. Our hope This faith is what gives us energy to sustain our love as we seek to contribute to God something better in changing our life to change our world. The Czech dissident and first communist president, uh, Veklev Havel, said it so well when he said, hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense regardless of how it turns out. Hope and healing is a reversal we don't have to wait for. It's one that we can enact every day. It is a people like us. It is we ourselves who exercise muscles of faith and effort, who heal bodies as physicians or caregivers or donors or lovers. It is we who work toward healing believe in working that God has something bigger in a recreation of healthy habits and habitats in our lives, our churches, our towns. It is we empowered by Christ who sow order and chaos and hope in despairing hearts. It is in this faith, it is in this posture that we can reverse and live through our what-ifs and turn them into blessings. Amen.
Let us be in prayer together. Heavenly Father, we pray for the whole of the human family, your children, our brothers and sisters throughout the world, for our nation and all nations of the world and their leaders, and all who have authority and influence, that there may be peace, freedom, and justice among all peoples everywhere. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all Christian people, for peace in your church, for the healing of divisions, that in faith and unity we may be constantly renewed by your Holy Spirit for mission and service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who suffer, for the victims of war and violence, of persecution and aggression, of disaster and accident. We pray for those experiencing homelessness and hunger, for refugees and asylum seekers, for the destitute and the oppressed, for the lonely and the unloved, and for those who mourn, that they may find strength and hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the sick in our community, those in the hospital or at home, for those whose minds are beset with anxiety and fear, for those oppressed or broken in spirit, for those who turn to us for healing and comfort that, together in you, we may find wholeness and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those people whose names and situations are on our minds and hearts, and we lift them up to you now. Lord Jesus, embrace them in your loving grace and healing power. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for one another and for ourselves that we may be instruments of your peace and joy May we know for ourselves and mediate to others your wholeness, healing, and salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you, gracious God. You have loved us from the beginning of time and remembered us when we were in trouble. You have come to us in Jesus Christ, who heals us and saves us from sin. You have sent us your Spirit to comfort us and lead us into all truth. Redeeming and holy God, we ask these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, the Healer, who reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Friends, we find in our scriptures that Jesus went about healing and sent his disciples out to heal others as well. In the book of James, there is the urging that those who are sick call the ministers of the church and request the healing, the anointing of oil for the healing of their lives. We remember that Jesus came as the Christ, the anointed one. And so in all these ways, we're reminded that when we come to a service of healing and we do an anointing with oil, and we are calling upon the God who sends his Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, to come to us with healing and wholeness and salvation. Sometimes there may be physical healing, but there's always healing of the soul and the Spirit, of course. And so as we come to this time, we invite you to have your oil ready and be ready to put some on your finger at the, at the appropriate time and make the sign of the cross on your back of your hand or on the forehead. If you're with family, maybe you do this for each other at the same time. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, giver of life and salvation, bless the oil before us for the healing of our souls. May those who receive anointing be made whole by the power of your Holy Spirit 
through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now we will be anointing oil with oil here, and we invite you to anoint yourself or anoint those around you or each other at home. Almighty God, we pray that all who are gathered in this service, connected for this time of worship and healing and wholeness, may be comforted in their suffering and made whole. When they are afraid, give them courage. When they feel weak, grant them your strength. When they are afflicted, afford them patience. When they are lost, offer them hope. When they are alone, move us to their side. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. as we go forth from this place, no matter what your what-ifs are, God and your church are with you. 
We believe that in the end, love will win. And so if love has not yet won in your life, it is not the end. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with kindness and fill you with peace. Amen.